Welcome back to the garage, everybody. Uh, we are back in the office actually today, but I wanted to take a moment to uh, go ahead and get back to the basics here. Look at the scanner. Let's touch on a couple things. These are kinds of tips and tricks that help me out. So I figured they might help some of you guys out. Uh, if you find any of these helpful, make sure and hit that thumbs up button down there. If you already knew all these, do me a favor, hit up the comments down below and share your favorite tips or tricks. And that way we can kind of get some more information out there, like how people are using the scanner. Once again, if you have not subscribed, hit the subscribe button down there, hit ring the bell. You don't want to miss out on any of the live stuff and uh, excuse me if I kind of stagger and stumble around here. This is the like third time I've recorded this because I had some recording issues earlier. As usual, it wouldn't be the garage if we did not have recording issues. That being said, thank you to all the new subscribers. We're about to break, what, 5,000? Let's just say 5,000. We're about to break 5,000. Uh, thanks to all the new patrons. Got a lot of new patrons. Love you guys. You're the greatest. And uh, yeah, let's just jump into it. Let's, you know, as they say, let's hit up the tune screen. We, as I said, are diving into the scanner. This thing is very powerful if you know how to use it right, but there's a lot of things that people don't know about it that we can kind of uh, get into that might help you out whenever you're going through the tuning process. And it all starts with the channel list. Well, I say I take that back. It actually all starts with the layout. You see, this is my preferred layout. You notice I don't run graphs or uh, gauges on here, but the cool thing about it is, is you can save your layout and then just kind of flop between them. So you can go into the basic ones, which are just like base. They're based on what the O2 is set up, whether it is going to be. Uh, uh, long-term fuel trims, AFR or Lambda, and then whether or not you're doing the manifold air pressure or grams per cylinder. And if you click that, it changes everything, brings it out. It's a little bit scrunched up because the window's small over here on the tune screen. <laughs> I always forget this, like looking in a mirror. But as I said, if you have different layouts that you like to use whenever you tune, like some people do, the nice thing about it is you can save that. Now, keep that in mind that your parameter list and uh, your math and things like that don't always carry over. Parameter list might, but I know math does not. So if you save a layout and you have done math on it and then you go to a different layout, it may or may not carry over with you. That being said, I'm going to jump back over to my tuning layout, get rid of those gauges, don't really care about those. And let's dive into the parameters. The parameters are, you've heard people call them registers or PIDs, which are parameter identifiers. Well, there's a couple things to keep in mind. One of them is, is you'll notice that there's different little arrows here. The ones that have an arrow pointing both ways are what are considered a polling parameter. And the ones with an arrow pointing one way are called a broadcast parameter. Well, what's the difference between those? That comes down to whenever we are running with bandwidth. We have a set amount of bandwidth. If you come down into the details down here, it will tell you uh, on your vehicle info, which I'm not hooked up or I don't have a tune in here, what the bandwidth is. Normally on a can, it's around 500 kilobits per second. That means you can only fit so much data per message in there. And a lot of times on the Gen 3 stuff before the CAN bus came out, you will have parameters disappear. That's because you've got too much information polling. But one way around that is by using broadcast parameters where they're available. And the quickest way to find out where a broadcast parameter is available is if you go into add a channel while you're adding these channels, filling out your channel list, if you go in here, they will have this green box behind them. That means it's a broadcast parameter. You can also unselect this and it will only show you broadcast parameters. Well, broadcast parameters are being sent out by the ECM to the network, to all the, the devices that communicate on the network, like your gauge cluster, or your BCM, all that stuff. So that data doesn't take up any of that communication overhead. It's already on there. We're just bringing it in. All these other ones though, those require communication overhead. So if we want to look at engine coolant temp SAE, we have to pull the uh, parameter from the ECM and get that back. Now, that's where we get into the other half of it. SAE, Society of Automobile Engineers, used to mean that may mean something else nowadays. It may just be SAE. These are standardized parameters in which they are the same. The address is the same. Everything is the same between any platforms that supports the OBD2 protocol. That's a good thing and it's a bad thing. In particular, it is a bad thing in situations like accelerator pedal. Oh, did you guys know that this text filter up here will actually uh, search for stuff? So if we go pedal, boom, 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 boom. Okay, accelerator pedal position. If you were to click on one of these 
and it prompted you to use the generic one. I've already got that one logged. Let me try. It's not going to let me. It's already. What it's going to often do is put you on the SAE. This SAE one, though, this is where you see things like the accelerator goes from 20 to 75%. That's because that is looking at a voltage and it is transcribing that voltage into a percentage that does not necessarily match what the ECM looks at from that zero to 100%. So you want to use the non-SAE in those situations. Now, the rest of them is probably not an issue. In particular, if you were using something like RPM, say they actually did not have a RPM. We type in RPM up here. If they did not have an RPM that was a broadcast one and you had to choose between regular and SAE, they're both going to do the same. They're both going to be an angular frequency. It doesn't matter in that situation. You can use the uh, generic one and not have any issues. But on things like your throttle body and accelerator throttle body throttle position this one will give you that weird number whereas the other ones should give you one that is more relative to zero to a hundred percent keep that in mind whenever you're populating your list now that we have that out of the way that's kind of the the back end of it the other things that we can do is we can do transforms in fact i have a transform on my wideband because if you were to look at the eq ratio that comes directly out of the 30-0310 a lot of times it is one decimal point off based on how many decimals you're showing on your gauge if you have it set up for two like i do instead of three decimal points it actually only brings in two decimal points in here and so whenever it is supposed to read uh, one it reads 10 you can use a transform for this and here you go in choose your parameter which in this case it would be under oxygen sensors equivalence ratio and it's right here whenever you then select it you can apply math to it this is also how you can apply scaling math if you need to or if you want to transform it, if you have it coming in as lambda and for some reason you want it to read as gasoline, you can scale it to gasoline that place. Some of the other cool things that you can do with parameters is, let's go ahead and open up a tune file here. We will look at a recent one. Is you'll notice that everything has a unit on it. And a lot of these are imperial. If you go into tools and you set up your options, you have the options between imperial, metric, and native. And most of us are going to use Imperial because that's what we're used to. But once the data is in there, it doesn't care what the unit is. So you can actually come in here at this point in time and change the units at any time. So say you're trying to follow along with somebody else that tunes uh, manifold absolute pressure in inches of mercury for some reason. You can still read inches of mercury. The data is going to be correct. Same ordeal on, I don't know, let's see here. Fuel pressure, if you want to see what your fuel rail pressure is in bar, we can do that. We can come over here, grab bar, boom, we're at 96 bar. That's cool. It's nice. It's helpful. Uh, and at the same time, even if it's reading in bar here, doesn't mean that it changes over on our graph. So that being said, let's take a real quick look at the math. You've seen me go into the math in the past. That's something that we really uh, use a lot whenever we... Uh, do our graphs. The cool thing is a lot of this stuff is predefined. You'll notice I have a lot of math here. The big one that I have to use is pressure ratio. Gen 5s rely on pressure ratio for your virtual volumetric uh, table as opposed to map pressure. And this was just straight up simple manifold absolute pressure divided by barometric pressure. Now, a lot of these other ones like Boost, they already exist. So make sure and double check your predefined list. Hey, there's the same thing. It's doing the same thing. So double check your predefined list for things that already exist. You'll notice this one's in KPA, uh, mine is in PSI, but you can change that. Same ordeal with AFR and EQ ratio error. And if you have to do some additional math, you can go ahead and copy these over and then paste them down below in one of these to do user math. Now there is one catch. Whenever you're doing something like this, if you put the user math in a specific spot and the graph is mapped to that specific spot, you have to keep that math in that specific spot or you will break the graph. And that's what I mean is if you were to save this parameter and then later you're loading it up and you put it in 11, that graph is still looking for the same math in spot two. 
Also, if you're in here on the math parameters and one of these has a pink box or appears red, that just means that the parameter is not in your list over here. You'll see that a lot on the wide bands, specifically the serial ones, that uh, sometimes they get out of kind of out of whack and you have to reboot your computer with the USB adapter plugged in because it will disappear whenever you start logging. Uh, if you were to go in and look at the math at that point in time, there would be a highlighted red PID in that group. Now, the other cool thing about it is, is, see this number right here? This is the extension. This is the units. If you were to go in here and hit edit variable, and we change this from Lambda to AFR, this is going to change this back number. Now, this first number is the actual PID itself. This one relates to the EQ ratio generic sensor PID, and then this is the units. You can view all of those underneath tools if you come up in here, go into quantities and units, and here they are. So say you were looking at pressures. Here is the extension after the decimal that you're going to see for all the different units of pressure. Just kind of useless, but neat to know. Uh, moving on, let's take a look at the graphs. The first thing that may stand out to you that a lot of people don't know is there's some of these that have red around them. Well, that is an indication that there's filtering being done to this graph. So if we come into the grass layout and we select one of these, Spark Advanced, you can see there's a function on that and it has a cell hit uh, filter. Spark Retard, there's no function, but there's still a cell hit filter, so it is showing up with that red box around it. And the thing about it is, is it gives you something to take a glance at and say, oh, hey, I've got something that is affecting the data. I may not be getting the whole picture. So it's just kind of a quick, hey, heads up, you may not be getting the whole picture. Cool thing about this is, though, just like everything else, you can save these graphs. You can, you know, transfer them from one laptop to the other. You can uh, have default setups. Uh, you can move them around. These things are very flexible, and you've seen me get into a lot of the graph stuff, and I've got some specific videos on doing advanced math and graph stuff, so I'm not going to get into it. Then the last but not least kind of thing, I'm, I'm not going to touch on the gauges because I don't use them. They're pretty self-explanatory, and the chart versus time really is also. If we come in here and look at our charts layout, we're basically just giving ourselves an accurate representation of the data that we are logging in the parameter list as a visual representation, and it's a good way to scrub through and and find data. In fact, I was using this particular log earlier to find points where driver demand was getting maxed out. And so being able to see the peaks on the RPM has been really helpful in situations like that. So make sure and use this whenever you're trying to troubleshoot an issue. Now you can come in here, change the different couple, couple different things around. So if we come in here, let's change this over to spark. Wow. Spark, 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 spark. Actual spark advance. We've got limits in there. Boom, let's look at it. You guys scrub this. Well, that one's not working for us. You have to scrub it around often to get that filled in. So Spark Advanced Sensor. There we go. 45 is a max zero. We're in degrees. We should be good there. Now, if we scrub this in, it should fill in. Okay, 24, 45. Now, you notice our... Details down here are still based off of RPM. Just a heads up, we're still going to be off of RPM if you're not logging RPM in these situations. So that's basically it. Pretty straightforward. Uh, nothing too crazy. But as I said, there's a lot of stuff out there that people don't realize that they've never messed with. And hopefully this sheds a little light on some of the things that you can do with the scanner. Makes you understand a little better uh, why we try to limit... Oh you know what that reminds me one last thing let's jump over i forgot to bring this up whenever we were talking about channels uh you can come in here uh, i've got to close this one out you can come in here and actually change the polling speed now on some of these things we want a high polling speed but if you're working on an earlier generation where you're starting to run out or you're getting these empty boxes whenever you start polling some of these you can adjust the polling speed now as i said there's no reason to do it on the broadcast one because that data is already been there it's not taking up overhead but like this one right here which is kind of redundant in this situation uh we can come in here and look at what the polling interval this one's at a one second polling interval i could bring this one out to 10 seconds because that's not changing that often same ordeal with maybe air calc mode. It's at a one second interval. I can bring that out to a two second interval. It's not going to mess with anything. But where it can be a very helpful is if I go into EQ ratio commanded, it's at 20 milliseconds. I've already bumped that up. I can make that pull even faster. I can make that pull every 10 milliseconds. And that's whenever we have the ability to up the rate of specific things that we're tuning. So if I were to come in here and do, say, uh, 
math tuning or something like that, I can clear up a lot of these parameters that I don't care about. And then I can ramp up the rate specifically on the ones that are related to the map, such as the mass airflow uh, and then the mass airflow sensor, which is the one that reads in hertz that's really important. So this one's at five hertz. Now I'm going to bump that up. I'm going to make that, you know, 10 times faster so I get a higher resolution data out of my data logs. Uh, once again, things like engine RPM, I'm probably not quite as worried about that one, so I can back that one down if I need to. If I don't need to, though, I can leave it where it's at, you know? These are things that you can play around with to get higher resolution data, get more data in on your log if you start getting those blank cells saying that you've maxed out that data uh, communications windows, and just kind of ways of... Uh, giving yourself a little more overhead in those situations. So that being said, hopefully, uh, as I said, you guys have learned something new. Uh, if you haven't, make sure and hit up the comments below and tell me your favorite uh, tips and tricks about this scanner because there's a lot of them that I don't touch on. There's a lot of them I probably don't even know. I learn new things every single day. It is completely possible. So let's share that knowledge, share that information. If you have any questions about the stuff that I just touched on, make sure and hit up the comments down below. If you find this video helpful, hit the like button. As always, subscribe. Check out the links down in the comments or in the description for the merch, for the uh, the, the decals, for the Patreon, all that fun stuff. You know the drill. Gotta go through there. I gotta say it. But as always, ABT, always be tuning. And I want to say thank you for stopping by the garage. I got to set this transition thing up. I don't know what happened to all my transitions. You know, here, let's try this. Is it going to transition? No. No. See you guys.